good morning to one and all and a very warm welcome i extend my sincere thanks to all the participants out there for sparing their precious time in participating in today's webinar on arm processors i swati you assistant professor department of information science and engineering vkit extend my special welcome to our resource person mr harish veer mekali welcome sir Thank you, Mr. Harish was born and brought up in Gatag. He is working as an assistant professor in BMSCE from to from 2010. Currently, he is pursuing PhD from IIT Bombay. His research interest includes embedded system. Hello. 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 Swati. Hello. Ah. Can you hear me? Your voice is not audible, Swati. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry for the inconvenience. Yeah, heading back to Sir's uh, uh, bio data. So um, he has fetched more than rupees twenty uh, four lakh grants for his IoT projects and robotics lab. He has twenty seventeen publications, including three patents, one copyright, seven international, and six national papers. He has taught seventeen courses in UG and PG departments of BMSc. He has delivered more than fifty guest lectures and trained more than two thousand five hundred plus participants, which is a great thing. I feel uh, great to speak about such a person today. Again, I welcome you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Before getting into the today's webinar, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. So, for all the participants out there, if you have any queries during the session, please drop in your questions in the chat. Hello. 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 Hari sir, yes ma'am. Ah, uh, you can start, I think. Start now, ma'am. Yes sir. Yeah. Is my screen is visible, ma'am? Yes sir, it is visible. Very, very good morning to everyone, ma'am. In case if there is a, a disturbance or the connection issue, please let me know. I will switch sure, to the other. Yes sir. on my phone like my phone is next to me you can just uh, text me on the whatsapp yes sir yes sir thank you thank you everyone thank you vkit and uh, thank you all the faculties of ec department and uh, all the faculties of uh, vkit for giving this opportunity uh, quickly st we'll start with the session uh, the session is about uh, introduction to embedded system uh, how do we uh why arm processors are so widely used what it makes so special and uh, we'll uh, start with uh, bits of bits and pieces of embedded system like uh, a definition of embedded system and then like what are the very important keywords that are need to be known uh, if i am going to study an embedded system and then we'll go to the uh, why arm processors and then like we will discuss on the architectures types of arm processors and then like we'll go to the architecture of arm processor 
so this session is planned for around uh, 45 minutes to 50 minutes session this is a uh, 45 to 50 minutes session uh, you can ask me the question at the end uh, if there is any uh, doubt please note it down i'll just start the presentation right so let's quickly jump into the uh, embedded system in the beginning like uh, what exactly is an embedded system uh, embedded system is a combination of hardware and software as a, as a as a person who have studied the embedded system uh, in different courses embedded system in uh, ug and the pg courses and also uh, taught them some subjects related to that uh, every test book every topic in embedded system uh, starts with an example that like okay uh, embedded system is a combination of hardware and software the best example for embedded system is a washing machine so every test book any example you if you take and uh, uh, look into that any test book if you take and look into that uh, any online search if you check everything says like okay the best example for embedded system is washing machine the washing machine yeah we will also start with the same there are many others like including our uh, uh, wi-fi router is an embedded system our uh, mobile phone and the laptop to the desktop all these are also part of embedded system but like we can say them as a general purpose embedded system so mostly when we say an embedded system it is about uh, a specific application a very specific application wi-fi router in that context is a best suited example washing machine is a best suited example so we will start with an example of washing machine uh, what what is there in the washing machine is a basic functionality uh, if if you start a washing machine it has to rotate clockwise 10 times anti clockwise 10 times let's talk about the old washing machines the new washing machines have a lot of features we'll not take that into the discussion at the beginning of the topic old washing machine that that's a feature it has so to rotate this 10 times clockwise and the 10 times anti clockwise we need to make sure that like there is a controller which controls the operation of this motor which is inside the washing machine which rotate this clockwise and 10 times and anti clockwise 10 times okay so to do that for that controller there will be a small program written on top which decides the number of rotations okay so we can define an embedded system as a combination of hardware and software that's a very very basic very basic definition of embedded system in, in the sense here what is an hardware for us a hardware for us is a controller and the software for us is a which uh, either written in c or assembly which goes on top and sits with the controller which decides how many times the motor in the washing machine has to be rotated and in which direction okay so to go in slightly deeper into the hardware what is a controller <coughs> controller controller can be said as a combination of uh, uh, alu or like i can say microprocessor plus the ram rom timer unit and some protocols and some io ports okay so in this controller it's a combination of processor ram rom and the, some other things the very important part is a processor what is a processor a processor again can be described in terms of a combination of alu registers timer units decoding units and some buses again if i take we'll try to zoom in and see like what where exactly this hardware and software get combined that's our goal right now so inside a controller we came to a processor inside a processor we will focus on to the alu what is an alu alu is an arithmetic and logical unit you can say like uh, We'll just again in the arithmetic and logical unit, we'll focus on the arithmetic unit. 
only in the arithmetic unit what's an inside that you can say they'll like if it is a four bit processor or a four bit controller so that alu will have it will take four bits at a time process it and gives you gives out the result that means if arithmetic and logical unit if i focus on arithmetic unit in that if there will be a kind of of arithmetic is okay we'll we'll basically look at look at to the arithmetic part like this anything and everything in maths is addition there is nothing but addition and edi uh, addition in the maths our subtraction operation is a addition division is addition multiplication is is addition integration is addition differentiation is addition everything is addition fundamentally one example that i can give you is 3 minus 2 which is subtraction can be written as 3 plus of minus 2 we are adding a negative number to a positive number that's a context so in such a case every if if a subtraction is addition then like we know the multiplication and the division are like uh, exploit uh, uh, a next versions of addition and subtraction and similarly the differentiation and integration so the fundamentally anything and everything in maths is addition right so when it comes to a processor arithmetic and logic unit in arithmetic section fundamentally there will be an only an adder in the bottom we 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 all have studied something like logic uh, design or a digital circuit design uh, in in our third semester or in the early engineering uh, years in there there is something called four bit full adder we can imagine something like that arithmetic unit will have this four bit full adder inside it what is there inside the four bit full adder there are four full adders next to each other we can imagine like that and what is within the each full adder there will be two half adders what is within the two half adders one xor gate one and gate so to generate the sum and the carry so that that's a fundamental block of our hardware an xor gate and the and gate which makes a half adder half or two half adders makes a full adder a full adder makes a four bit a combination of full adders makes a four bit parallel adder a combination of these can make it as 8 bit 32 bit whatever the bit processor that we want the uh, this full adders a four bit full adder like combination of that is the integral part of an alu alu is a core part of a processor processor becomes a core part of controller okay, that's the hardware layer that we should imagine so fundamentally there is an xor gate and the and gate okay now if you remember that we have done one experiment in the uh, logic design or like digital circuits design that like a adder can be made to perform the subtraction right that there is a adder comes subtractor experiment in the our logic design uh, subject where which we defined some bit called as an m bit m is a mode bit if m bit is zero the whole parallel adder will act as an adder if m bit is 1 it acts as a subtractor right subtractor is as i told you an example it is nothing but like 3 plus of minus 2 right 3 plus of minus 2 what it is doing is it is taking a ones complement of the second number right to do this this m bit is connected to a input of an xor gate where in which if xor gate input one input of an xor gate is zero then it passes the another input as it is to the output if that one input is one then it passes the complementary of another input to the output i'm i'm speaking of two bit uh, two input xor gate when one input is set to zero it passes the another input directly to the output if that bit is set to one 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 uh, input of an xor gate is set to one it passes the negation of the another input to the output so with using this phenomena we can convert xor gate as a buffer or the not using this phenomena itself we will create 
an adder comes of tractor circuit. So this is all decided by that one bit. We'll call that as mode bit. If the mode bit is zero, whole circuit is acting as an adder. If mode bit is one, the whole circuit is acting as a soft, uh, subtractor. This is a fundamental experiment which links the hardware to software. Hardware to software. The M bit that whatever we are saying there is our operational code. Is our operational code. If M equal to zero, our operation is addition. If M equal to one, our operation is subtraction. So that forms a fundamental one bit of code. Okay. Similarly, if the if the if the, the, the there is a complex ALU which has multiple bits of more bits like M, then it creates the multiple of codes, right? Of, of codes are the fundamental units in the software. Using this of codes, we will define the something called as mnemonic in the assembly level program. From this assembly level program, if as, as and when its com program gets complicated, we shift it to the high level program. We have defined this op code as a symbol there, plus, minus, and or gate, like equal to something like that. Using all this, we create some uh, function in this in this in the high level language. Using these functions, we create a program. Using this program, we create this software. We will say set of programs is a software. So what is that I'm trying to say is, I'll just wind up. I, I believe like uh, this, this uh, topic of discussion or conclusion here should give a clarity of the discussion till now. What is that? An embedded system is a combination of hardware and software. In hardware, when I say hardware in embedded system, it is mostly a controller. In the controller, if you go on looking what is inside the controller, we will see a processor, we will see an ARC ALU, we will see an adders, and we will see a half adders, and then we will see the uh, XOR and the AND gate, using which we can create an uh, adder cup subtractor circuit kind of thing. Similarly, if I look at the software, the software is a combination of programs. A program is a combination of function. A functions are written in the high level language, or it can also be written in the uh, assembly level language called as subroutine. So in context of high level language, if I consider the a function will have an instruction inside, each instruction depends on the opcode that is defined fundamentally. Whoa, whoa. So what is this opcode? An opcode is a one, fundamental unit of a software which defines what hardware has to be done or what function in the hardware has to be executed. So when we say this topic, we should be clear of what are the depths in the software, what are the depths in the hardware and where it exactly gets connected. Right. So this is an important topic. And after th these are the uh, that's a definition of embedded system, and this is how we should look at it. And after this, there are two more words that are very important in the embedded system. That is memory. There are many different types of memories in the embedded system. Basically, we divide them into the volatile memory and the non-volatile memory. Non-volatile, we will mostly say it as ROM. Volatile, we will say it as a kind of RAM. So RAM is our volatile memory. ROM is our non-volatile memory. What do you mean by volatile and non-volatile? Uh, if I remove the power, the content stored in that memory will go off. It is a volatile memory. If it is a non-volatile memory, the content will still retain even if there is no power supply. Right? So the quick example for volatile and non-volatile, non volatile RAM, non-volatile ROM. We'll consider that as an example as of now. So <clears throat> the memory is one where in which we store the information. Of course, yes, that's a, a correct reason. There are different types of memories again in the uh, controller apart from this RAM and the ROM. We can define that. We can define that. If I consider my computer or my uh, 
mobile phone the fundamental memory that we have or whenever i purchase a mobile will come in the reverse direction let's see a, for a computer i have a hard disk i can attach a pen drive i can attach a, yeah i can attach a pen drive uh, there is a hard disk and then there is a ram then there is a cache memory inside a processor then there is a registers inside a processor or i can say uh, there is a register inside a processor then there is a cache memory on to the chip of a processor or a processor chip so i can define these five types of memories in my computer what are the five types of memory register memory cache memory ram memory hard disk and pen drive just look at this different types of memories five different types of memories these five different types of memories will facilitate it in lot in design of a system like if i go to a register they are the highest speed memories that are available in the system but they are too costly and check with the that's where like the size number of the or like register memory is is is, is it's in the very minimal it's, it's defined in number of bytes at the end on other end if you check with the pen drive it's a, a slowest possible memory compared to all this five the pen drive is the slowest possible memory but cost wise it is damn cheap okay hence mostly the pen drives will come in gb or hard disk if you take an external hard disk then it comes in the tb right now okay so pen drive an external or hard disk will consider till hard disk will consider okay done hard disk is a huge memory but it's a slow memory because it's a damn cheap registers are super high speed memories and they are in very small size uh, in, in in our uh, uh, laptops because they are super costly okay so then there is that's about the memory then there is one more term which is very important in embedded system that is protocol a protocol uh, a, a by definition of a protocol it is a set of rules right uh, we can say let's say, let's say like we'll we'll take it into a general consideration that what is a protocol a protocol uh, is a rule that need to be followed for example if i have to drive on the streets of india i should uh, uh, drive on the left side of the road okay if it is on the some other part of the world then it is on the right side of the world like this i'm just saying that's a rule that we follow on the street when we drive on the street that's a pro protocol defined by the rto office similarly we have a protocols uh, in a every stage of life or everywhere in a family we have a protocol mom does this uh, dad does this that their responsibilities the kids does this their responsibilities are different in a school we we have a protocol like principal does his work hod and the uh, professor and the assistant professor there is like we can we have heard a lot of many times that like okay come through a proper channel they follow the protocol something like that okay if there is an organization or if there is a system or if there is a, a coordination between any two entities there has to be some protocol that need to be followed without a protocol we just cannot communicate why i am saying this is a language by itself is a protocol the rules in the language are defined by something called as grammar grammar defines the rules for the language right every some predefined meaning if i am talking in english you should have already and have an information about what is the uh, each word meaning and how it is connected using the grammar so in a our com communication is proper and uh, uh, our communication can be understood only because like we agree with the common rules of the english grammar and the common rules of a dictionary meaning of these words right so that that's a generic understanding of the protocol so what's a what's a point in saying that is 
a protocol is required wherever there is a communication between two entities wherever right it is similar in electronics also okay the most widely used protocol at present is an internet protocol ipv4 or ipv6 we name it as exact to, to name it exactly it is ip version 4 or ip version 6 okay so we we also know we have also have some other protocols like uh, usb is a protocol using which we connect our mobile to the laptop so mobile and the laptop exchanges the information right so that that's that's based on usb protocol then like that there are lot of other protocol like for example we will we'll give one more example we have an sd card which goes into the mobile this sd card is read card content is read by the processor and that get displayed on the screen so the communication between processor and sd card is mostly on some protocol called as spi serial peripheral interconnect similarly there is there, there are other protocols uh i can say i2c is a protocol inter integrated communication can is a protocol which is used in a uh, automobile uh, automobiles wherever we have electronics in automobile these electronics devices in automobile communicate with each other using a can protocol right so there are so many protocols in electronics depending on the application depending on the context of usage that that's a particular word depending on the context of usage we have so many protocols okay again from like we did the uh, uh, hardware from top to bottom microcontroller to the uh, adder the xor gate and the and gate software we saw it from the programs to the op codes the memory from hard disk to the registers in protocol also we can classify them based on the distance as most of you know it is lan wan man and the internet right so there is a lan there is a wan so and there is a man and then there is a internet local area network wide area network the metropolitan area network and the internet in the large the we'll just uh, speak with respect to the lan lan is mostly about 10 meter to 100 meter range what if it is be below the 10 meters then we call it as a pan personal area network what if it is below that 1 uh, meter we'll call it as an on board protocol on board protocol on board protocols are something like spi i told you like when um, sd card is inserted the my processor will read, read that information that's kind of on board protocol now what's within that is a non chip protocol if we have studied like 8086 processor there is an 8086 bus architecture and the protocol itself is 8086 protocol for on chip communication of uh, 8086 processor so generally it is said as an x86 protocol like that for arm we have something called as an amba advanced microcontroller bus architecture so this is an on chip protocol now look at from the on chip on board personal area network lan wan man and the internet if the internet has to work properly that means on chip protocol should work properly if the on chip protocol communication is proper then the, your internet data exchange is proper okay so the, that's the conclusion of the slide this is called as like i have named it as an abstraction layers of an embedded system there's a hardware layer software layer and the memory layer and the protocol layers right so i believe like all these layers are clear right hardware layer software layer memory layer and the protocol layer uh can i just uh, ask uh, uh, organizers is it audible properly uh, it's is it going on properly hello ha ah, sir one minute hello sir ha ah. correct a kelta idalla madam ಯಾಕೆ ಹೇಳ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಕೇಳ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಸರ್ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂ ಮಾಡಿ ಸರ
So that's about an embed system. I believe like all these four words are clear and it's the same perspective and these are very fundamentals. And I believe uh, this sets the context of understanding between the between you and me. So if you have the more clarity that we have on these four words, the more clarity that we'll get on the understanding of the further topics or like understanding of any any test book or any uh, uh, any topic related to embed system that we want to study, these four words are keywords. If we have an understanding of these four words from the bottom to the top, then our understanding goes easily. Okay, that's the intention why we took this topic or why, why, why we took this slide. Right, let's look at the one by one things now, like what's a computer architecture, because this is again forms the fundamental uh, uh, part of any computer, any computer, whether the a simplest computer for for in in my view is a calculator and the most complex computer is our brain from the calculator to our brain what is a fundamental architecture which is common in all this is this slide every thing that we call it as a computer will have something like this it will have a central processing unit, a memory, and input output device. And of course, a clock unit to define the timing for this circuit. We'll come to that, right? So anything that we call as a computer right now, from a calculator to our brain, will have this four fundamental units, central processing unit, memory unit, IO unit, and the clock unit. And this, four units are connected using something called system bus, right? What are the system bus? We have a data bus, control bus, and the address bus. So the communication between, between these blocks is possible because of these buses, OK? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll come to the, we'll uh, take one by one part and discuss which is in context with our discussion today. A central processing unit is mostly like processes the information. That information which is stored in the memory uh, here. Is memory is compulsory? Uh, it's, it's all started with the von Neumann uh, stored program concept. Otherwise, memory was an optional, which used to be a part of IO uh, unit. Because central processing unit is super high speed in uh, processing the information, whatever we want to process using the central processing unit, we will store that information in the memory. OK? And whatever we want as an external human beings want to interact with the, uh, the system, we'll do that interaction through the input output device. And the clock circuit, clock circuit defines when there has to be a communication, sorry, not when, how much duration has to be the communication between the memory and the CPU and the memory and the uh, IO or like IO and the directly the central processing unit. Okay, so these are the functional uh, definitions of this block or like what, what are the function of this block? These are the functions. What about the buses? Buses. Uh, OK, I will, I will just try to give you one generic example. Hope you'll understand with this context. As I told you, like this is a structure which is common for from calculator to a human brain, which I consider as like most complicated uh, computer. If, if there is an event, then you have to react to that event. Right? Then this is how the situation works. I'll just give an analogy so that like this, this becomes clear. Now, like uh, there is an event that like uh, mm, you want to write something on a paper that you want to write something. Okay, the first thing that goes is a central processing unit, a brain sends an information to the right hand or the left hand, de depending on the uh, your comfortability. Right, it chooses the device. A brain chooses the device, a right or left hand. That happens with uh, with respect to the address bus we can consider that as an address bus 
so it sends an information to an address of right hand or the left hand once the address is sent that that hand is selected then it sends what is that to be written for example i want to say hi okay then brain sends a signal okay this is the information to be written then like the hand should move in that passion then the control bus decides when you start writing and when do you stop writing right right hope this this point this uh, bus understanding is clear with this this analogy whenever we want to do some action then we need to have to decide how do we do action just by speaking or like by hand by leg or these are our input output devices or i can say in particular output devices right so it has to select these devices then it has to send an address then what has to be done through this devices it has to be sent through the data bus then like when to start and when to stop is sent by on the control bus to do this we have a distributed set of neural uh, network in our body which does this okay now what coming to this topic of clock circuit every processor and every uh, this every controller has a clock circuit okay what is this uh, it defines what's the duration of each operation in the uh, processor or the structure okay so a clock circuit is basically like 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 we said like okay we'll start the uh, this uh, today session at 10:30 uh, how do we know like everybody has a watch and we have a common timing based on which we synchronize synchronize so if any event in the processor has to be synchronized we need some time reference that is what is this clock hope this point is clear now so clock, job of clock unit is to synchronize the operations okay now that's about the computer architecture uh, as i told this is common from a calculator to a human brain i believe everyone is clear with this and the uh, io devices or our output devices are my are uh, uh, voice or uh, is an output output uh, hand is an output device and the leg is an output device it can be treated like that all our five sensors are input device you can think like that okay that's an analogy okay now we'll particularly look into the this is a generic computer architecture and you take any processor on the world or any computer on the world this is what it follows now for let's focus on a central processing unit cpu oh uh, sorry <clears throat> we will just go to one topic where in which a broader classification is done and then we'll come to the what types of cpus and the types of memories into that right uh, this is again like a classification of microprocessor and controller uh, if you if you if you check the any video question paper this is a standard five marks question paper standard five marks question okay in that in the in the microcontroller or like microprocessor paper but fundamentally uh, a processor or a controller is designed by us depending on the application we design like that for example like to go to my college i every day i use the my two wheeler right and nobody says like i cannot use a 10 wheel lorry to go to uh, college we can do that but it is not designed for that thing and nobody says that we uh, we cannot use the helicopter to go to college we can use it but we cannot afford it right similarly there are some things designed for some application if the application has an intense processing requirement then processors are used if the application has controlling features demands uh, uh, controlling features in it then we use a microcontroller and accordingly these have been designed so what what's the point in the mentioning this is a microprocessor is for processing application microcontroller is for controlling application that's it whatever is required for that operation we include it in one chip and we call that as a microcontroller whatever is re required for this processing application we include in one chip we'll call that as a processing application 
right so this is a context of application defined terms processor is for processing controller is for controlling now we cannot control something without having a processing information like i need to control something then that means that i need to understand and i need to process the information and then like react on to it right so controlling is not possible without processing hence like there will be a small processor within the controller also right with this understanding you can go on the listing out the difference between them but that's a fundamental understanding processor is for processing controller is for controlling now let's look into the types of cpus there are, basically there are two types of cpus sysc and the risc sysc stands for complex instruction set computer risc stands for reduced instruction set computer what's the one fundamental difference between risc and sysc uh yeah it has when it is started it that it has a clear cut differentiation nowadays it's all about like utilizing the best of both we'll come to that point whenever i say risk the fundamental requirement in risk is every instruction should should be executed in one cycle every instruction in risk has to be executed in one cycle and mostly it has to be of same length of instruction in sysc it can be of different length of instruction and it can execute in one or multiple cycles so that's a fundamental difference so risk is basically all the instruction will execute in the same duration of time and almost of the same length sysc is different length and different timing in to execute what do you mean by this whenever i say reduced instruction set computer that means we'll quickly jump to the uh, with example hope, hope with the example it will be uh, it will give a more clarity in case of arm which is a 32 bit processor we have around 40 to 50 op codes in case of x86 8086 which is a 16 bit processor we have 500 plus op codes hope this is clear the number of op codes defines the type of cpu it has there are 48 to 50 40 to 50 or like maximum 60 op codes in the arm so that that makes it mostly risk actually arm stands for advanced risk machine right i just took that as an example of risk here we'll discuss what is the advanced part later so advanced risk machine risk in here has 40 to 50 to 60 at the maximum sysc as an example the number of opcodes goes up to 500 as an example when i have more number of opcodes it is very easy to design a software for it because it understand the more words so i can write using those words i can write the software very easily when risk risk understands only like 50 to 60 words anything that i want to say to it like i have to tell it only in those 60 50 to 60 op codes hence writing a software on a sysc is a very easy job writing a software on the risk is a very tedious job what do you mean by software here i it, it starts from uh, assembly language program or an assembler itself or a compiler itself or like any level of program that we want to we can define so what's the point in saying this is again in risk software is complicated hardware is simple in sysc hardware is complicated uh, software is simple which what's our choice it our choice depends on the application again we cannot say like this is the best this is best both of has its own advantage and disadvantage we'll we'll hope we'll take that in in our uh, coming session and uh, we can go to the go through the classification based on this understanding okay uh, this is again this slide again says like uh, in sysc uh, 
greater complexity at the hardware level processor level in risk the greater complexity is at the compiler level processor hardware is simple here okay Right. And then there are two types of memories. Uh, there is a one human memory and the Howard memory. Uh, one human memory has a one memory where in which both the data and instructions are stored together. Hence, the instruction is fetched first, decoded, and then the data is fetched. In the Howard, data and instructions are fetched together, and they because they are stored in separate memories. What is the advantage? Howard offers an advantage of speed, where is where in which one human of offers advantage of space. Again, what is best depends on application. What's your option? You want to compromise on the speed or space? Depends on that. Okay. So again, different ARM, any processor or any controller. If you check, like mostly they will be available with available with both the version. One human. Uh, memory structure also on the Harvard memory structure. Okay, right. Now, with an understanding of all this, this is all goes to the fundamentals. I think we have taken good time on it. Uh, now we'll come to the point that like, what are the options of microcontroller and processors we have in our market? So these are all like. Microcontroller suppliers or like micro processor or like controller suppliers. This is the NatMill, Texas Instrument, NXP, Microchips, Silicon Labs, ST Microcontroller, Renesis, Infineon, Cypress Semiconductor, Panasonic, Samsung, and then Intel. All these guys. There's so many already like microcontroller suppliers in the market or processor suppliers in the market. Why we need to study on the ARM? That's a fundamental question that we need to address, right? So, uh, uh, excuse me, ma'am. Like, can I extend it for another twenty minutes? Do I have a time? Sure, sir. Sure, okay. no problem. Sure. Right. So, with all this understanding of uh, risk risk types of memories howard von neumann the protocol memory hardware software what is microcontroller processor with this is a basic understanding now we'll venture into the part when there are so many suppliers in the market why we need to study the arm processor itself we have fundamentally like four or five reasons we'll look into that thing Let's see. ARM is most widely used or came into a limelight, we can say, like popularity, only because of portable electronic device popularity. From the time when uh, handheld devices, like uh, we, we, we had something called SimCuter before a mobile comes into picture, or we had this uh, idea of laptop making, or like mobiles, pager. Uh, video games, electronic toys, calculators, all these are all these are part of uh, portable electronic devices. So ARM's major popularity is because of portable electronic device. Whenever we have this electronics which is portable, we need a processor which consumes as low power as possible. Hence, a low power processor becomes very, very important. So, ARM is the world's most low power processor that is available at present. At present, okay. Second point: smallest size by the num by the number of gates that uses or number of transistor that this uses, it's smallest compared to a similar performing processor offered by any other com company in the market right now that's the second reason it's the smallest it's, it's size in the microcontroller is also same as a real estate business on the bangalore or in any part of the city right you increase the size you you have to pay more okay 
and we wish we wish our mobile should be uh, comfortably smaller right hence our processor has to be smaller in that context then there is an important part called as like high code density this is what made arm unique compared to other low power uh, controllers or processors other low power processors like arm has this concept called as thumb mode and arm mode there are two modes in arm whenever we want to execute a simple operation like addition of two numbers subtraction of two numbers very simple operation like and operation or operation something like that we can do those things in the thumb mode thumb is actually thumb is actually 16 bit mode in arm arm is actually a uh, 32 bit mode that's that's the analogy again so if i want to execute a simple operation i will go to a thumb mode which is 16 bit mode i can put more instruction of 16 bit in a program instead of using a 32 bit instruction for the same thing that's where thumb mode became popular our thumb mode is a key uh, design feature in arm which gave it so much of popularity right if you take any program the complex operations in that program will be very minimal there will be one two or maximum three or four or like i can say 10 percent of the program there are complex or 20 percent of the program there are complex operations most of the programs i'm saying remaining 80 percent of the program it will, there will be mostly simple operation like fetch the data store the data do or some simple operation then like store it back fetch it to the memory send it to another memory all these simple operations are done in 16 bit hence in the memory of 32 bit i can put more number of instructions more number of 16 bit instructions so whenever i require the complex operation then only i will go with r mode if there is no thumb mode if there is a 32 bit memory i want to fit the 32 bit instructions into that memory the num each instruction is 32 bit in that context whether it is a simple operation or a complex operation the number of instructions will increase greatly so by introduction of thumb mode in a given space you can put more number of instructions that's what we call it as a code density a very high code density right next one a very low cost why it is low cost because of its business model i think i will take this if the time permits at the end uh, arm has a, a versatile business model they 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 have a they have a total different business model we'll come to that in the end of the slide like end of this presentation if it times permit if not if i don't take up you can ask that in the question and uh, question session we'll answer it there then okay one more important feature of arm is easy to debug what do you mean by debugging debugging is finding an error of the error in the program where the error exists whenever we code and dump it to the controller then it start giving an error to understand where is an error i should know what is going inside what is going on inside a controller if i know what is going on inside a controller or a, inside a processor i can easily say like where is a error in that right so what arm did is they have attached this debugging circuit to a processor directly and made it as an integrated part of processor itself okay so what is the debugging feature in, in this uh, mostly arm uses the jtag debugging feature in the initial initial uh, structure like arm 7 tdmi what is there in our syllabus it has a jtag debugging feature what it does the J jtag circuit which is sitting next to the processor will scan all the data movement all the register content before execution of instruction and after execution of instruction and send it to a computer to a programmer right where in which i can say okay this is a possible error easily 
if there is no such feature it is very 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 difficult to find out like where is an exact error in the in the 10000 lines of code of program it is very difficult to find so arm integrated this debugging feature to a processor and made it as an integral part of a processor okay these are the five key features why arm is so famous so famous and arm has achieved the best results in all of this it has lowest power smallest size highest code density lowest cost and very easy to debug feature these are the five reasons why arm processor is so famous or so widely used in most of the again remember this is this is hugely contributed towards portable electronic device till today we rarely use arm in the desktop computers till today we rarely use arm in a servers mainframe computers right so mostly arm is targeted to the portable electronics device what do you mean by another side like there are in the world there are more number of portable electronic devices than a desktop or a servers or the mainframes that's where like the popularity of arm is so much okay right so arm has a 32 bit alu 32 bit bus uh, bus width 32 bit registers 32 bit port arm is all in 32 bit all arm features are all in 32 bit okay everything in arm is 32 bit that that that's way i can say it on the main section hope this point is clear again if there is any doubt we can all, all, always discuss on the question session question answer session there now understanding with, with an understanding of why arm is why we need to work with arm processor or why we need to select an arm processor for our design or application now we'll look into a part that like what are the types of arm processor that we have arm processor that have been designed till now can be classified into two types of processors classical arm processor cortex arm processors classical arm processors are something like arm 7 arm 9 arm 11 these are the three main um, arm processors which have which have got wide popularity in the market there might be another other uh, control uh, pro processors launched by arm company but like not got that popular in the market so arm 7 is a first first uh, processor from processor family from the arm that got widespread uh, application okay again because of thumb instruction and the debugging feature that they have added of course the low power and the small size and the cost also but majorly these two reasons arm 7 9 and the 11 are like just an increase in the complexity of the basic arm 7 family arm 7 family like an example i will tell you arm 7 family has three stage pipeline arm 9 family has five stage pipeline arm 11 family has seven stage pipeline it is just an increase in the complexity of the same fundamental architecture okay arm 7 9 and 11 once they came to this point like of designing arm 11 they understood that there are so many different applications we cannot fit all the applications or we cannot fulfill all the application requirements using a single processor type hence they have launched three category of processors and then they started saying it as a cortex family of processors there is a cortex m series r series and a series you can see this all marked in red or cortex a series they are designed to work with some operating system and hence they are mostly mostly the part of mostly the part of our mobile right mobile has this uh, android operating system hence if you check what is the fundamental processor which is there in the mobile 90% of the mobile it is mostly an arm cortex a series processor arm cortex a series processor right 
then there's a cortex r series processor r series is for uh, time critical applications or i can say like r stands for real time applications where in which a stands for application processor cortex application processor cortex real time processor cortex microcontroller type processors or microcontroller uh, processor for microcontroller type of applications okay so cortex r is widely used in 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 where in which wherever there is a time critical application for example i'll just give one quick example uh, in our flash whenever we need to capture a photo if i use if i'm using the flash flashlight the flashlight is available only for that small duration and the image has to be captured exactly in that duration if it is captured slightly before or after the, there is no use use of having a flash on a mobile or any camera camera mobile i'm saying so the real time defines a task has to be happened within that time if there is time crosses there is no use of it and this cortex r series are most widely used in automobile uh, sectors especially for airbags if the if the car has an airbag then when when a car meets with an accident the airbag has to open in that duration where in which the chest should it should open before a chest should hit the steering because of an accident that normally like when we are driving with in, uh, with, with 100 kilometers per hour when when there is a crash or when there is a crash or an accident it is uh, <clears throat> our, our, our it is high probability that like we will go and hit the steering a driver will go and hit the steering especially our driver head uh, or the chest part will crash against the steering hence there will be a airbag inside a steering which will blow up and then like uh it gives a cushion effect between the steering and the chest on the face of the driver so that airbag has to open in that short duration if it does not open in that short duration it opens slightly before or after that it's of no use these are very very time critical applications so for that kind of application cortex r series processors are defined or designed then there is something called like microcontroller based uh, uh, processors or like i can say like processor designed for microcontroller applications those are called as cortex m series in here like time is slightly plus or minus time is okay and these are mostly used to, uh, uh, wherein which uh, to develop a uh, uh, a home automation if i if i just come inside a room or inside a classroom the light should go off the presenter like the um, projector should turn on the screen should come down and all this should the it should monitor the temperature turn on the fan in or the ac in particular temperature if it has to be happen all these things has to be happen we need to monitor the entry and the exit of the people and monitor the temperature control the fan control the lights these kind of applications cortex m series are used so in arm processor family there is a classical processor and the cortex series in classical there is an 7 arm 7 9 and 11 after that they have classified the processor based on the application criteria or application requirement cortex m series r series and a series a series example mobile r series go with example of real time application like airbag or a flash of a camera or like uh, the camera in the mobile the m series is for like some controlling application that like kind of home home automation thing that i have just mentioned okay so these are the types of arm processor families okay now this this is an again uh, slide that uh, requires slightly when we go in depth i just mentioned about i'll just mention a word about it and 
go to the next one arm processor 7 and 9 are called as family of processors they have a common architecture called as arm processor architecture 4t 4t stands for thumb right architecture version 4 wherein which 7 architecture version 7 is wherein uh, in in that architecture version 7 they have defined cortex series of processors till the architecture version 7 they have defined only like classical processors 4 5 version 4 5 and 6 are all classical processors okay so just to give you a clarification arm 7 and 9 this is the best is easy example to understand arm 7 and 9 are different family of processors in arm but they have a common architecture version called as 4t architecture version is common but complexity is different okay done with that okay this is one important slide again this is uh, why there is a uh, one more important part of uh, arm as compared to a software designer for example if i am designing my software and i have used an arm cortex m0 family example i am just taking cortex m0 family of processor because i felt that processor ability which is uh, small simple and uh, low cost i felt that like it will fulfill my requirement i used it this is the example scenario i am taking and then like as i go on designing like uh, my application goes went on com uh, uh, increased uh, com- with the increased complexity then like i have shifted to the cortex m3 series of processors when i shift from m0 to m3 i don't need to change the code the code that is working on m0 and m1 will also work on m3 then again if i shift it to m4 or m4 with floating point unit the highest complexity of uh, right now uh, when i made this slide cortex m4 with floating point unit was a complex microcontroller that was available if i shift from cortex m0 to any of this higher series i don't need to make a change because the instruction set the opcode set of cortex m0 or m1 is a subset of the cortex m3 m3 inst- opcodes are a subsets of m4 on m4 of course are subset of m4 floating point unit controller so what it means is though i can change the complexity of the processor i don't need to change the software part of it mostly it remains same right this is called an upward comp- compatibility this is a very important part in 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 case when it comes to the design and applications okay right now we'll hit to a point that like okay what exactly is an arm based microcontroller or a processor looks like before going to the slide let me be very very clear arm has not fabricated or manufactured not even a single processor till today it is a processor design company which supplies a design to a other companies like samsung panasonic uh nxp texas cypress so these guys will manufacture a processor the my controller and send it in the market so arm basically supplies the processor to them hence if you look at arm based controller in the market or arm based uh, uh i can say like socs in the market soc stands for system on chip in the market it has similar architecture or similar structure this is an arm processor which is attached with the debugging feature i have already told you what is the, why is this and what is this right with this arm processor core they have attached amba axi this is an amba axi which is a high speed bus from here it goes to the apb bridge this is connection to the low speed bus amba apb amba stands for as i told you amba is a arm on chip protocol okay 
APB stands for Advanced Peripheral Bus. So this is a slow speed bus. We will just say uh, APB is a slow speed bus, AXI is a high speed bus. That means if there are devices or like if there are units that, that operates in the higher speed, we can connect it to the AXI. If there are units which are operating at the lower speed, we can connect it to APB. So RM provides two types of on-chip buses, AXI and APB. And communication between these two types of buses will happen through this APB bridge. Okay. For example, for example, <clears throat> if it is a memory like a RAM, extra RAM need to be added, flash memory or a pen drive need to be added to uh, this processor, then it gets connected to the AXI bus. See to this. This is a flash drive or SD RAM gets connected to the AXI bus. From AXI bus, it goes to the ARM processor. This is one. The other side, if I want to add something like a <clears throat> counter or I can say a TV remote uh, or I can say a motor control or a temperature sensor, something like that. These, these are considered to be slow devices. These can be added to a custom peripheral here. Here I can add a sensor, I can add a counter, I can add a, T, uh, a, re, a remote receiver that gets connected to APB, APB through the AX, APB bridge, it connects to the AXI, through AXI it goes to the ARM processor. Data from temperature sensor goes like this inside a ARM processor. Okay, so what ARM offers to these guys or these manufacturer like fabricator is that It offers this ARM processor core with these two buses. It is depend on depending on application that how much of RAM flash memory need to be interfaced to this, how much of uh, uh, ADC or a counter need to be interfaced to the this custom peripherals. So custom peripherals are decided by the manufacturers. ARM offers processor core with this bus structure okay so that's 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 the arm architecture uh, which is used in almost all the uh, mobiles right now it follows the same thing arm provides this processor core with the bus qualcomm interfaces these models which are in the show shown in the orange color and the pink color, like it's a Qualcomm responsibility, launches it as a Snapdragon, which goes into this mobile. So Qualcomm designs this Snapdragon chip. Inside that chip, there is an ARM core provided by an ARM company, right? So in any processor or a controller that presently exists on the earth, they have they use a similar architecture. Okay. Right. So with that, I just wanted to uh, conclude. Uh, Ma'am, we are done with the time. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. So I am done with the topic. This is just an introduction. Like, why do we use ARM and the types of ARM and like, what is the uh, what is the ARM based SOC looks like? Okay. And I just have okay. some of the references to be mentioned. I'll just mention and then like uh, opens for the questions. Okay. Some sure. Uh, are like there is a video lecture series available by Chris Shore. Chris Shore is an ARM training manager uh, from the ARM University program. That's a YouTube link for uh, it's it's available on the YouTube. You can go and search for Chris Shore ARM videos. You will get it. There is a professor from IIT Bombay uh, called as Dr. Santanu Chaudhary. His video series is also video lecture series are also available on the YouTube. You can also uh, access them. Also, uh, my my lecture videos are available on NPTEL VTU's uh, learning content. You can access it from there. 
and there are some the i get all oh, i i got all this information from info infocenter.arm.com that has a huge information right and the test books uh, andrew sloss is a, a well known author in the arm so his test book called as uh, by title arm system developers guide is very famous steve ferber is actually an arm employee another test book author steve ferber is actually a one of the arm um, initial designer and uh, his test book is also quite famous arm system on chip architecture these are the two uh, very widely used books throughout the world and uh, yeah this this is a uh, uh, joseph u arm cortex m3 this is not concerned with arm 7 but uh, if it is concerned with arm cortex m3 architecture in particular so we can refer it in that context okay so these are the some references from where i collected all the information you can also directly go here and uh, get a further information i should be thankful to arm and uh, arm university program in particular for supporting me in all this direction most of the materials most of the um, controllers that they have given me have, has helped a lot uh, i have set up a lab with help of them they gave us around 100 uh, controllers free of cost uh, and it, it it has a policy in the arm university program uh, i'm just with this uh, thing i'm just uh, uh, asking everyone to utilize it you can go to the arm website and the arm university program in particular they have the uh, arm university program supporting packages where we can register and we can get the some controller boards to work on okay right with that i'm thanks to uh, the vkit thanks to every uh, all the faculties of vkit who have uh, given me this option uh, or opportunity to present hope it is useful if there is any question please ask uh, i'll i will just open a question answer session with this thank you sir uh, it was a very informative session uh, we have few queries that was put up in the chat box i'll be asking you that uh, sure. The first question was, uh, one of the participants asked, uh, could you just tell us about the swap instruction in ARM? How can it be coded? Oh, OK. The, this this uh, section was an introduction to the ARM to explain any, uh, any uh, instruction in detail like that. We need to understand the processor architecture, very particular processor architecture. Uh, okay. We, without uh, understanding an architecture, we cannot. It's very difficult to explain the swap or any instruction encoding feature. That, that that's anyway. Uh, one thing I can do is like if you send me this is my uh, website and this is my YouTube link. You can just refer to any one of this. If you send me a mail, I have a content on this. All the instructions uh, of ARM seven and ARM Cortex M three. I have made a detailed notes. I can share with you. If you still have a question, you can ask me based on that. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, the you. next question was, uh, what is pipeline bubble in ARM? Pipeline bubble? Yeah. Pipeline bubble? I, 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 to be frank, like I don't know exactly like what is a pipeline bubble. There are two important concepts in the uh, pipelining structure of any, pro any processor. One is uh, pipeline stall, another is pipeline flush. Stall is somewhere where in which we have a different length of instruction. The one instruction gets added with some duration of extra time, where in which it has to wait for that duration simply. Maybe that is called as a pipeline bubble. I'm not sure with that exactly. OK, OK. Thank you, sir. And uh, so like we have, uh, when it comes to the job opportunities, like we have for process application engineer or an embedded engineer, one yeah. of the main skills they look forward for is an ARM. Yeah. Yes. So what 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 do they uh, what are the requirements when it comes to an industry side when it comes to an ARM? Okay, that's again a more general question. Like if you take an example in Bangalore itself, we have okay. uh, microchip at mail. Atmel and microchips, they are same now. NXP and Bosch. Bosch uses a lot of uh, ARM-based processor. TI is there. 
Texas Instruments, Cypress Semiconductor, uh, LG is there, uh, Qualcomm. All these companies are there in Bangalore and including ARM uh, companies there in Bangalore. They mostly do work on uh, two things. When I spoke to them, they mostly work on the two things. One, they companies like Bosch, LG, and Qualcomm, they develop applications using ARM uh, boards. Hence, they do develop a device drivers for it. Device drivers is something like you understand how the ADC works or how the uh, uh, USB protocol and ARM works, and then you write uh, libraries for it. So that's the fundamental job that when I spoke to an LG guys, I understood that way. And also the Qualcomm and the Bosch. On the other side, uh, companies like uh, Texas Instrument and uh, uh, Cypress and Microchip, Samsung to an extent, Samsung, these guys work on silicon. I mean, like a VLSI part of an ARM. They take the ARM processor from the ARM company. They try to integrate a memory to it or a external protocol to it. So that's that's basically they work on the VLSI part of it, right? Both these job options are there in Bangalore and also throughout the world. Like, of course, throughout the world, but they are also in the Bangalore. So VLSI side is also there. The device driver side is also there. To connect to our academics, we need to be thorough with our. Uh, if 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 uh, you are using a C programming for a keel, we need to be thorough with that. Using which we can develop a device drivers. If you are using a Cadence tools or Synopsys tools, you need to be thorough with that to go towards a VLSI design in the ARM uh, processor field. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And one more question. What are the thumb instructions? Okay. Uh, thumb instruction is a 16. You can say like, <clears throat> if, if, if there is an operation just to copy a content a data from a memory to register, this is a simple operation, right? To do this, a 16 bit instruction is defined. And this 16 bit instruction to do this kind of operation, 16 bit instructions are defined. These 16 bit set instructions together, we call it as a thumb instructions. These are separate set of instruction in ARM, when which compared to the 32 bit instructions in ARM called as an ARM instruction. So ARM itself has two types of instruction supports, two types of instructions, thumb instruction and the ARM instruction. Okay, thumb is basically for doing a simple job on and off this thing. You need ARM. You need ARM usage, then like you need to have a heavy job. OK. Uh, what are the advantages of thumb mode of ARM? Yeah, I, I just mentioned that in context with the uh, code density. You can put, if, 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 if imagine if there is no thumb instructions at all. All instructions in ARM is 32 bit. And we have 100 memory locations to write a program. Then you can fit a small program into that, a small logic into that 100 memory locations using 32 bit instructions. Right? That's I have told you again. I have told you before also. Because if you take any program, there will be 80% of simple operation and 20% of complicated operations. Right? Even for simple operation, if we use 32 bit instruction, we can fix a limited number of instruction in 100 memory locations. Similarly, if I take, let's imagine now like thumb instructions are there to do a sim simple operation, then I can fix more number of instructions in that 100 memory location. Hence, my logic that I, I can write a code with the, the logic, that logic can be extended. The program can be extended. Uh, in other words, I can pack more number of instructions in a smaller memory using thumb instructions. So hence, thumb contributes greatly towards high code density. Given memory, more logic than like thumb is supports that in a greater extent. OK. Um, the last question, sir. What is the cost of ARM and microcontrollers? 
cost yeah cost it's very difficult to say because it, there are like it depends on the types of processor and uh, quantity and all that i heard i heard and i studied it on the this thing that like arm lowest possible uh, uh, processor or a base arm based controller is of sub dollar i can say like around 100 to uh, sorry 70 to 100 rupees that's the cheapest one like it goes on with the complexity and the, with the quantity it goes on and then again like it is different from arm processor to arm based controller arm based controller i am saying cost from uh, 60 or 70 to 100 rupees cheapest one okay okay so uh, i think there were only these many questions in the chat box sir i would like yeah. to extend my uh, sincere thanks once again for being Thank a part you. of this webinar and we look forward for more and more sessions from your side thank you sir sure. yeah thank i you. would like to thank yes sir. If, if, uh, to to just to mention it again our university program has a lot of supporting uh, uh, tools and also they have a, a, a big team working behind this Army University program. Anybody from academic academics can contact them. Anybody. I'm not saying like uh, I'm different from you. Like anybody from uh, academics can contact them. They will support you in all direction. They have a huge resource in terms of materials, in terms of uh, materials in the sense they will send you a hardware board to work on. I'm saying the hardware material itself. And they have also a study material. Right, we can directly okay. uh, get in touch with Arm University program. That they have a very good supporting system. Of okay, course, you okay. can contact me. Like uh, I have also uh, been doing this kind of workshops. Uh, I, I, I can share my email ID on the screen. You can contact me uh, through that mail ID also. Yeah, so for all the participants out there, I think if they have uh, more queries, I think you can contact Sir with the details uh, displayed on the screen. Um, I would like to even uh, extend my sincere thanks to Janata Education Society, our beloved principal, Dr. Kumar Kenche Gauda, our beloved vice principal, Dr. D.V. Chandrasekhar, and our uh, head of the department, Dr. N.P. Netravati Ma'am, for their continuous support without whom this webinar wouldn't be successful. Thank you all. I would also like to extend my thanks to all the faculties who have been part of this event. Thank you. And finally, I would like to thank all the participants for sparing their precious time and being a part of this webinar. So please stay tuned for further webinars from this channel. And if you have any queries, please do contact Sir with the details which is given the website link the youtube link as well as his personal mail id is being provided so please make maximum use out of it i would again like to thank you sir it was a way informative session uh, looking forward for more sessions from your side thank you uh, so the feedback link for the particular uh, session will be mailed to your registered mail ids so please drop in your genuine feedback and stay tuned for the further webinars thank you Thank you.